Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Golf Courses Within Your Association. This webinar is sponsored by Association Reserves, Inc. My name is Kathy Schrader and I'm the Director of Communications at Association Reserves, filling in for Paige Daniels, our Marketing Coordinator. I'll be serving as your moderator for today. A golf course for many is a great amenity to have within your community. The price to keep it looking and playing its best is costly though. So the big question is, are you properly planning for the future of your association's golf course? Golf Courses Within Your Association is a 45-minute webinar designed to help make sure your association is preparing for the inevitable, predictable repairs and replacements associated with a golf course. Today, we're fortunate to have with us Robert Nordland, the founder and CEO of Association Reserves, and his guest, Michael Nash. Michael is the president of our Inland Empire Coachella Valley Regional Office in California, which is home to the communities of Palm Springs, Palm Desert, and Rancho Mirage. With approximately 125 golf courses in this region, it is one of the world's premier golf destinations. Now before I formally introduce our speakers, and while we're waiting for everyone to get logged in and settled, we'd like to get to know our audience a little better. So I have three quick polls. Here's our first poll. Have you attended one of our webinars? So please click on the answer. Great. Looks like everyone has been to a one to our one of our webinars before. Now for our second poll. What is your role in the world of association governed communities? So let us know what your role is. Well, thank you. We've got a bunch of interested homeowners. And for our final poll, do you have a golf course at your association? Let us know, yes or no. And it looks like everyone does. Great. Thank you very much. Now keep in mind that you can ask questions at any time by typing your question into the question box at the bottom of your control panel. Robert and Michael will answer your questions at the end of the formal presentation. Now it's time to introduce our two speakers. Oops. As I mentioned, Robert Nordland is the founder and CEO of Association Reserves. He is also a registered professional engineer and a CAI certified reserve specialist. Robert was involved in creating National Reserve Study Standards and has greatly influenced this industry for the past 27 years. He regularly writes on the topic of reserve studies and speaks at industry functions throughout the nation. With this background, Robert is often called to serve as an expert witness in litigation involving reserve funding issues. Michael Nash has been on the Association Reserves team since 2009 and serves as the president of our Inland Empire Coachella Valley Regional Office. Michael is also a CAI Certified Reserve Specialist and has prepared hundreds of reserve studies. He has extensive experience with the unique challenges faced by HOA communities with golf courses. During his free time, Michael is a recreational golfer. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to Robert Nordland. Robert? Well, thank you, Kathy, and hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar. Michael and I are here today. Michael, can I get a hello? Hello, everyone. We're here today to pass on some key concepts and reminders that will help you prepare financially for the ongoing care of your golf course assets and not create an unfair financial burden on future owners. Golf courses are beautiful amenities, but they're complicated. There are a lot of hazards to avoid as a golf course ages normally. So Michael is going to walk you through the major components and assets of a golf course, basically acting as your caddy on this subject, to guide you through to a successful experience. Thank you, Robert. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Michael Nash. And the things you're going to learn today in today's webinar 
the importance of planning ahead, the five categories of golf course components, miscellaneous case studies, and third-party maintenance options. First up, planning ahead. A golf course, it's, I love golf courses. They look fantastic. They provide a great year-round sport in the right climate. Um, but the price to keep them looking and playing their best is costly, though. By planning ahead, the results will be reflected in your property. It will optimize course performance. You'll be performing timely maintenance. There will be a cost and time efficient. And what we ultimately provide is a peace of mind to know that your course is taken care of and planned for in the future. On the other side is, is the failure to plan. And uh, it's a process my mentor described as the head in the sand method. Basically, you're hoping all your expenses will be covered by what you have decided to put aside in the bank. By not planning, there is a much greater percentage that your HOA will incur the following elements. Special ass assessments, deferred maintenance, and lower property values. The thing we're all working from here is that reserve expenses are inevitable. Uh, by cutting corners, deferred maintenance will ultimately catch up with your association. Think of the most beautiful hole on your golf course. Now think of the many ways in which that hole has been maintained. What type of landscape equipment, irrigation system, green refurbishment? We start with the knowledge that expenses are coming. We identify those expenses and set up a plan for the future. The only question is, how well prepared will you be? So in making your plan, the basis of such a plan are the components. Now, it's a list. It's an items that are based on reserve studies, national reserve study standards, excuse me, and it defines what your association is being funded through reserves. Your reserve component list forms the foundation for your reserve study, as it defines the scope and schedule of your reserve expenditures. Fortunately, National Reserve Study Standards has a four-part test for helping us. Um, the first check mark, uh, common area responsibility. Second, the component must have a limited useful life. Third, it must be a predictable remaining life. And the fourth part is that it is above a minimum cost threshold. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I did want to establish this foundation for when we were discussing golf course components. Another part of the hard data when you're compiling these components is you are going to get the quantity. I use irrigation controllers as an example. You want to know the quantity, how many irrigation controllers on the golf course. Useful life. When the irrigation controller is brand new, how much life should that have? The remaining useful life is how much life that irrigation controller has left in it in the present. And then finally, a current replacement cost. Now we can look into golf course component categories. Uh, there's basically five general categories these components will fall into. A golf course itself, lakes and water features, maintenance equipment, irrigation systems, and ultimately your cart fleet. First up is the golf course itself. I'll get my bad analogies out of the way right now. This is the quarterback of the team the star of the movie, the face of the franchise. I think you understand. First off, general, kind of renovating your course. The ASGCA, the American Society of Golf Course Architects, has provided general guidelines for renovation. As you will see, some of these ranges have a wide parameter, so you need to know and understand your course intimately. Most importantly is that you tailor a renovation to meet your course needs. This is not a one-size-fits-all um, procedure. By knowing the problem areas, specific design features, and maintenance procedures, you'll make that renovation a successful one. To plan for renovations, you really need to know your course. Greens. Uh, a, golf, a golf superintendent told me early in my career that there were five deadly sins of the greens. First one. One is that they drain too little or they drain too much. They're too small for large shots, or too large for small shots. And finally, too freakish for any shot. Greens are traditionally listed as the number one factor in how a course is judged. If the golf course is the star of the movie, then greens are the face of the star. 
ASGCA recommends between 15 to 30 years. So you can see the wide range we're talking about. The cost also varies greatly. If you're looking to rebuild a green, then that price is in the $40,000 to $50,000 range. And by the rebuild, you're completely gutting that green on your property. A uh, lighter refurbish, more minor repairs, maybe, you know, left front edge needs a little lifting. Uh, you're looking more in the 4000 to 5000 range. Uh, it's less work, uh, less intensive work, I should say. Next up is bunkers. Uh, bunkers, unfortunately, are one of my favorite places to be on the golf course. I should tell you a little bit about how I golf. Uh, but I always notice the sand consistency. I always notice the depth. Uh, are there drainage problems? When replacing sand in the bunker, it is recommended at that time to replace bunker drainage pipes if necessary. Also, look beyond your current bunker system and ask yourself if there are holes that would benefit from additional bunkers or better bunker placement. Bunkers add to the challenge and can make holes more interesting and varied. Once again, prices will really vary on how extensive a job this is. Uh, as you can see in that photo there, it's, that's an extensive rebuild of a, of a bunker. And in terms of the cost, it's going to vary greatly. Uh, the ASGCA does recommend between five and seven years. So there is a, a, a smaller window for bunkers. Next up, there are tee boxes. Now, the golf is a difficult sport. And the last thing a golf short course should do is to provide an unnecessary challenge. A tee box that does not provide a level area from which to start could prove harmful to not only your game, but also the local tree system. Examine the size, usable area, and alignment. At 15 to 20 years, the ASGCA provides a more defined range. It's rare to have to rebuild a tee box, as most courses just refurbish to solve any issues. A typical, a typical cost for a tee box is between $2,000 and $3,000. And finally, we have fairways. It's the element of the golf course that has usually the longest cycle of renovation. Due to the sheer size, though, it can also prove to be the costliest if the fairway has deteriorated to a point where an extensive facelift is required. There are new strains of superior grass constantly being developed as well, uh, liken it to uh, cell phone technology. Just when you get the most recent and hottest phone, nine months later, that's something that does 10 times better what you're used to. And so when you're looking to renovate a fairway, uh, a typical renovation would include the following steps. Eradicate the existing grass. Next would be to till and loosen the compacted soil. Then you dethatch remaining debris. Any areas where drainage is poor would need to be regraded at that time. And ultimately the resurfacing of the fairway with your chosen new superior grass. For a standard renovation, the cost is it's really depends on the size of the fairway. You're talking maybe fifty thousand to seventy-five thousand um, dollars. And once again, the scope of the project is, is really the main indicator of, of ultimately the cost. Out on the golf course, there are miscellaneous items as well. Uh, issue of cart paths, cracking, lifting, root damage. What is the condition of the current paths? Also, are there holes that would benefit from the relocation of a cart path? In regards to landscaping, trees are a major area to examine on the course. A number of factors such as general appearance, are they overly affecting the play, and are they the correct type and size of tree for the location? Trees and even plant material affect the overall aesthetics as well as course play. Ultimately, what we're talking about here, what all these things add up to be, is the character of your course. Uh, these components make up what people know about your course. You're much better positioned to elevate your golf course by knowing its character. Uh, the one uh, golf course I play that I, I remember so well is this place called The Quarry in Riverside, California. And it was made out of an old rock quarry. And so it's a very tough, rough, narrow course that uses these sheer rock walls to provide a border on each hole. And they've just done a great job of everything they have done to enhance the golf course has played to that characteristic. And to this day, I must have played it eight years ago. It still remains fresh in my mind. 
Now, uh, next around to current conditions in the life cycle. You want to look at all these individual components and their cycle of renovation and look at, look at them all together. For example, if you see renovating the fairways in five years, and in looking at the bunkers, you feel that you would need to, or it would be better to add a couple fairway bunkers. Make sure those projects work in conjunction. That ultimately usually helps with the cost of the project to bring it down, and you're not co closing the course for longer than you need to. Uh, I want to bring up just an example in this. It's, it's what I like to call the bunker problem. Uh, and the bunker problem existed uh, out in the HOA, and front nine was playing great with their bunkers. The back nine was very poor. It couldn't be much different. They were, there was no consistency of the sand, no depth. Um, and ultimately what they discovered was that the back nine faced a different direction and was met with a certain amount of wind later in the afternoon. Now what they did was by dissecting the problem, they put the back nine on a tighter renovation cycle than the front nine. So the back nine was getting renovated every two or three years, while the front nine was every six years. And that's, that's knowing your course. That's understanding the challenges it faces and using your reserve study to help plan those projects out. And ultimately, when you complete this, you, have, you come to something like this, which is your reserve component list. And in the left column, you've got your greens and bunkers and tee boxes. Uh, the next column over is how long you think those items have as far as a life. The next column over is how long you think you have left with those. And ultimately, the cost. What's, in, what's important to know about this list is that it's a fluid document. This is not something that is set in stone and needs to be followed by the rules. Uh, as you update the report, as years go by, you may notice the fairways aren't, aren't aging as well as you would have hoped. So maybe that 20 becomes a 16 the next year you renovate, I mean, uh, that you uh, update the reserve study. Uh, it is a fluid document. It is meant for helping you plan out your future. Um, I can't stress enough that it's, it's not a rigid piece that you need to adhere every rule to. Next up, as far as golf course components, are lakes and water features. And not to be too dramatic or too ominous, but there really is a potential for disaster, both financial and physical. The first area are lake liners. Uh, a majority of golf course lakes are man-made entities that use a lake liner to seal the cavity, typically a polyethylene geotextile fabric for lake water retention. Now, when these were first installed, the belief was that they were going to be a lifetime component. Unfortunately, the lifespan of these liners is approximately 30 to 35 years. And depending on the amount of lakes, it can be the single largest line item in the study. Uh, the first example I'd like to bring up is case study A. And what happened in this case was the HOA discovered that there was a big spike in their water usage. Much more water was needed to keep some of the lakes level at the correct height. In fact, it was costing them an additional ten dollars to $15,000 a month in water. With such a big spike, they suspected there was a problem with the lakes and leaking. Uh, ten other lakes were also on their property, so they needed to know where they stood with the other ones. They brought on a, it's usually a geological company, uh, that provides a lake condition assessment. And after the, the report, they knew that those, line, those liners were not lifetime. In fact, they had a range of six to ten years left. It was time to plan. And plan they did, and they were able to meet that, ultimately that $750,000 cost given that amount of time. The flip side is uh, case study B. And it's one thing to be blindsided by a cost, especially a cost you felt you were not going to incur because the component was considered a lifetime component. It's another thing to have actionable data that your lake liners are failing and to not plan for eventual replacement. An HOA suffered through a period just like this. They're doing fine now, but it really threw that association into turmoil for a number of years. Uh, multiple lakes were failing, replacement costs were coming in at close to a million dollars, and the reserve fund, because they had not planned, it was unable to handle the cost of lives. 
special assessment time, association, and turmoil. Um, and just now, after a number of years, are finally coming out of that. The cost of a link liner, it's a significant financial impact. In order to give you a point of reference, this is the most recent replacement cost for a lake liner. I looked over the last six studies that involve a lake on a golf course and came away with a typical cost and size, 30 to 40,000 square feet. A typical lake is going to be 157,000 to 210,000 just for the liner. I say just for the liner because there are additional lake components. Um, when you get into lakes, you're talking about lake circulation pumps, aerification systems, fountains and lighting systems, filters and skimmer baskets, and the control panel itself, the variable frequency drive. There's substantial cost beyond the liner itself. Ultimately not as expensive as the liner, but they're very much all reserve items in their own right. The, uh, the interesting thing about lake components is, is how they are stored or how they are kept. These are two pump houses. And these two pump houses are the same age. Uh, unfortunately, the one on the left had a metal frame with a canvas roof that ripped off pretty early in its lifetime and was never replaced. So you've got rust, surface wear. Uh, you don't really see it in that photo, but there was water on the floor pooling under one of the pumps. Uh, and ultimately, you run dangers in terms of when you're running electrical equipment through there. It would just appear a little unsafe as well. Well, the one on the right, it's covered, it's protected, it's continually cleaned and maintained. And why I bring up this example is that ultimately, despite being the same age, the one on the right is, is going to reach its useful life. The one on the left is falling well short of that. Uh, and that's really maintenance and ongoing care. That brings me to maintenance equipment. All golf, all golf courses need proper maintenance. The question for an HOA is twofold. Do we have our own maintenance staff or do we farm it out? I found that most places have staff on hand to perform maintenance. And then it's ultimately do we lease or purchase our equipment? Now the lease or purchase is important for the reserve study because the lease, the equipment is not included in the reserve study. The equipment is not owned by the association. In the event of a purchase, we do include in the reserve study and plan for eventual replacement. I do want to stress, there's no right answer in this matter. It merely is what is the philosophy of the board, of the management, uh, which path do they want to go down. It does not matter to us either way. It's interesting to note, though, that in looking at this equipment, I mean, forget the Porsche, forget the Lexus. This is some, these are some real high-performance vehicles here. You've got your fairway mower, $50,000. You've got your rough mower, $65,000. And you're going to need a couple of these, two, three, maybe four. And I'm not even going into the green mowers or the tractors or the spreaders or the sprayers. It all adds up. And just as important as the cost is the useful life. How often are these pieces going to be needed to be replaced. Um, a lot of associations, associations I with, work with do have a really good maintenance staff that's able to keep these going for a very long time. Uh, next up are irrigation systems. All right, so you got your greens refurbished, your lake liners replaced, your maintenance equipment is working great. But why is your fairway light brown? It's the most frustrating thing. It's, up to now, we've kind of talked about things you've been able to walk out on your course and see and judge. Well, maybe not lake liners. I, I certainly hope you're not able to see your lake liner from the golf course. Um, with an irrigation system, there's a lot going on under the surface that you're unable, unable to see. The elements of an ir irrigation system include irrigation controllers, heads, valves, and pipe system, pump stations, and computer hardware and software. With the controllers, you'll see these boxes arising from the rough in most circumstances. The major companies like Toro and Rainbird have controllers specifically for golf courses. The issue with current controllers 
is the lack of flexibility provided. For example, you have a brown dry area off the front left of the fairway. To water that spot means turning on the station, which waters not only the spot but also the whole front quarter of the fairway. It's overkill and ultimately you're not doing anything to conserve water. Next up, heads, valves, and piping. Now this is where we do not have eyes. We rely on input from the landscape companies, golf supervisors, and other professionals. The system is not a lifetime component and will eventually need replacement. Recently, a couple, a couple 18 hole courses have upgraded or replaced their irrigation system, and the costs were in the million to 1.5 million range. We do currently know of a complete replacement that will be taking place soon. 36 holes for approximately $5 million. Definitely one of the higher costs I've, I've encountered, but they can handle it because they have been planning on it for a number of years. Next up are the pump stations. And much like the lake pumps, the irrigation system has their own set of pumps and motors and control panels. And once again with these, to get the equipment to reach their useful life, good consistent maintenance and care is essential. Also, storing these, you know, these pumps and motors in a protective area really helps out in the long run. And finally, the one I'm most excited about are the computer, hardware, and software developments that have been taking place recently. Going back to our controller example, uh, advancements in technology are going to allow for golf course supervisors to smartly attack brown areas on their fairway. For example, there are specific systems where the head of a sprinkler is outfitted with a microchip and from his smartphone the golf supervisor can turn on one specific head to get to that one specific spot. Um, it's smart thinking, it's forward thinking, because you're ultimately conserving water. And that's becoming an issue in a number of places where water is an issue and perhaps not, not as much water should be provided to golf courses. Next up is the cart fleet. Um, I always feel it's a good representation of your course and your brand. Uh, much like maintenance equipment though, what we need to know for our purposes is, is it a lease or is it a purchase? Once again, it's, it's not, there's no right answer for this. The current prices on a new electric golf cart are I'd say in the $5,000 range. And you certainly want quality of cart that's going to reflect well on, your, on the perception of your course. There are other elements to a cart fleet. Uh, the typical cart is electric. It runs off batteries located under the bench seat. So you're looking at um, a couple thousand dollars in batteries underneath that bench seat, and they typically run out prior to the cart itself. Uh, another item that typically wears out faster than the cart itself are the bench seats themselves. These are all items that we have included in reserve studies and plan for replacement. Once again, it's, it's really it's about planning ahead. Um, these are daunting projects and costs can be made much less stressful with proper planning. Your lakes are going to be nice and full and your reserve fund is going to look good. One last item I want to talk about is, you know, wouldn't it be easier for an HOA to not be responsible for the golf course? There does exist a third party option. Uh, there are HOAs that exist where the golf course is managed by a third party. You can still enjoy playing the game and your HOA doesn't have to be responsible. I mean, that sounds, that sounds great. But careful what you wish for. And certainly, there's an association I know of where the third party that took over the course was losing money, going towards bankruptcy, and they started to cut corners as far as maintenance. Uh, you have lakes that remain dry without a lake liner because they can't afford one. You have brown areas of rough because they've decided to cut back on water and only water the fairways. And you've got this HOA with beautiful homes, but as you're driving through, you hit stretches of brown grass and lake beds, and 
because the HOA is not in control, it doesn't it has no control over the golf course. Uh, I'm sure there are third parties out there that are that are very good at controlling the golf course. I don't mean to say that, but the whole point of this is that you do lack the control of uh, of the golf course. And ultimately, what we're talking about is the future of your golf course. It's a, a successful golf course is not one that is continually changing, but one that is evolving according to a plan that will leave the course playable during construction and the reserve account robust and healthy. Now, these next things, these are questions that I throw out to you as a way to you know, stimulate conversation within your board, uh, within your committee discussions, in order to provide a different perspective on your golf course. Uh, is your golf course supporting or drawing the optimum number of rounds or memberships? Or are these down because of poor playing conditions? Can you compete with other golf courses in your area in terms of golf fees, uh, in terms of green fees, excuse me, if open to the public, and the quality of golfers who play your golf course? This next one I, I love. It's, it's always a good kind of man on the street one is that what's your golf course's reputation among area golfers? So you guys have friends in the area, people who know about your golf course, get some feedback from them. Get some real honest feedback. And fourth, is the general golfing experience a positive one? Or would improvements to the golf course make it significantly better? Ultimately, I throw these out as a way for you to, to, to go to your members and committees and, and see where their head's at. Because once you have come to a consensus as far as the future of your golf course, you should update the reserve study to include those plans. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today for the webinar. Uh, at this time, welcome any questions you might have. Thank you, Michael. As I mentioned earlier, you can ask one of our presenters a question by typing your question into the question box at the bottom of your control panel. All right, Michael, I have a question here from Tom. Tom wants to know what is the percentage of associations that own their maintenance equipment versus lease their equipment? That's a good question. Um, I've found that approximately, I'd say, 75% of our clients own their own equipment. I'm um, just going off data kind of for my area, so I can't speak for the whole area, but that seems to be pretty consistent with, with the community. Um, and like I said before, these places that own their own machines also have an excellent maintenance crew that keep their equipment in tip-top shape. I think the idea of owning it is that they control it and can extend it beyond the, uh, the normal useful life. Great. I have a question here from Marv. Since we can't see our lake liner, how can we determine its condition? Well, the, the best way, and I mentioned it briefly, uh, can go a little more detail. It's it's because we don't strap on scuba suits. Uh, unfortunately, as a reserve analyst, uh, we don't immerse ourselves in the lake and check it out eye to eye. Uh, the best way is to bring in an outside professional, often from a geological company. Uh, for something called a lake condition assessment. And these are the guys that focus on geologic studies. They go get out in their scuba suits, get down and dirty, assess the condition. Um, I've seen a number of reports by these guys. They're fantastic, very detailed, and from my experience, very accurate. Okay, great. I've got a question here from Mary. Are there major cost differences between a mountainous course versus a desert course? Well, I guess one of the major differences is that of landscape. Um, with mountainous courses, typically, you're going to find many more trees. Uh, desert courses, there are some trees, but I see a lot of them with the desert landscape as well. And some of these mountains courses, you're talking about the cost to trim trees or removing and replacing the trees, which can add up very quickly. In terms of the actual golf course, I think the costs are fairly similar. Uh, rebuilding a green on a mountainous course 
is going to be fairly similar to a desert course. Um, the only th possibility might be accessibility, which could drive up the cost to some of these places. Um, the actual golf course price, as I just, once again, it falls into the scope of project as opposed to area. All right. Here's a question from Justin. Should we lease or purchase our golf carts? It's a, it's a common question and, you know, like I said, I, I hate to give an answer on it because there is no right answer. It's really the philosophy of, of the board and of the community. Um, the one thing I can tell you is that from a financial perspective, there appears to be some cost savings when you purchase your equipment. Um, with lease, you're subject to financing rates. And additionally, if you purchase your maintenance equipment and you have a good maintenance staff, you can keep these carts in pretty good condition. So when you're ready to replace them, there's the resale value of the old cart. All right, and I have one final question. And the question is, what is a good cost threshold to use to decide what components appear in the reserve study? That's a, that's a great question and one that, you know, fortunately always comes up because associations are different. Um, and this threshold is normally uh, related to the, I guess, the signature authority of a manager or board member. Kind of what's the maximum amount of money they can they're authorized to spend on their own. Um, another way to look at it is a percentage. Uh, typically 0.5% to 1% of the association's annual budget. Um, in, in more concrete terms, I can tell you with golf courses, they're typically larger associations and larger associations with much bigger budgets. And the really large-scale communities we've done, we have used $5,000 as a threshold. Uh, the reason we do, we do that, and I will say $1,000 is our typical threshold for a normal community, but the reason we do $5,000 for large-scale communities is that if you were to include all items above just $1,000, your reserve study would be massive. It would be cumbersome, and we're looking to have a document that people can access easily, access information easily, and, and, and the major costs from. I think that. Great. Well, you. thank you, Michael. That concludes our webinar. If anyone is interested in a recorded version of this webinar, you'll get an email with a link in a few days. You can also search for any of our webinars on YouTube, or you'll find links to them on the Association Reserves website, which is www reservestudy.com. If you'd like to receive our monthly newsletters or receive announcements of future webinars, please visit our website and click on the Join Our Mailing List icon. As you exit this webinar, a brief survey will display. If you could help us out by completing the survey, we'd be happy to e email you an outline of the key points that Michael addressed today. I want to thank you all for attending. If you have any questions or if there's any way we can be of service to you, you see Paige Daniels information here on the screen, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you again, have a great day, and goodbye.